the <coughs> present situation generally looks like this. The <coughs> in many ways, as I already indicated last time, the economy is very strong. It is uh, very productive. Productivity has grown rapidly. And at the present time, the, uh, all, the major, uh, all the major troubles of Italy have, in fact, been fixed. Now, if you remember, I mentioned the following problems. I mentioned, uh, un I mentioned inflation, unemployment, deficits in the balance of payment, government deficit, corrupt government, and bad government. Uh, the only one of these problems that has not yet been fixed is unemployment. The others have been fixed, but people don't understand it, and therefore they haven't been fixed. Now, specifically, what has not been fixed, according to the way people look at it, is the deficit. The Italian deficit, according to the latest program which was adopted, financial program which was adopted earlier this year, the, <clears throat> the current deficit is somewhere above 7% of GNP, of, of uh, GDP, uh, and it's programmed, uh, hopefully, to come down, but slowly, so that by 1996 or 7, it would still be in the order of 4%, three and a half, something like that. And uh, that means that in terms of this program and these figures, Italy could not possibly enter Maastricht in time because Maastricht uh, has certain parameters, certain requirements. The deficit must be less than 3%. The inflation must be not more than, well, I guess, has no more than some small number above the lowest inflation. Okay, so you look at the lowest, and you cannot be higher than some fraction of that. The three lowest, I think. Similarly for interest rates, you cannot be more than some margin above the three lowest interest rates. And uh, the... Um, and these are the only parameters because, as we know, Maastricht uh, parameters do not include the, one, the only one that should really be there, as Lucio and I agree. That is, there should be a parameter for unemployment. You should not enter if your unemployment is more than 5%. Okay? But that parameter does not enter Maastricht. Only, the only thing that matters is inflation, unemployment, no one cares. That's no problem. Not, no, no German problem. It is, of course, now. And, but still, they insist that they don't care. The central bank policy can only be directed toward keeping down inflation. No other thing matters. So, of course, unemployment is also high, so that even by that standard, Italy couldn't enter. But it could not enter on anyone. And, of course, the remaining requirement is that the deficit be less than 60% of GNP, about 50% or 60% of GNP. In Italy, that ratio is one and a quarter. So way out of the range. Now, essentially, uh, the key point is that <clears throat> the reason why it seems to be so far away, I mean, the key parameter in this is the government deficit, okay, the 7% deficit, as against the 3% requirement. So that if you now ask in Italy, what are you going to do about it, you have two lines of reply. One is, we just cannot meet Maastricht, we will not enter Maastricht, we'll be second in the class and we'll enter later, God knows when. God knows when, because if you don't enter, that makes the problem of entering more difficult because then the exchange rate will be unstable and interest rates will be high. And with high interest rates, the deficit will keep being high. So a major problem is the deficit. And that high deficit 
is purely fictitious. It's not there. It's because the official way of calculating the deficit by German diktat, the Germans are the powerful, no matter how stupid they are, whatever they say is it, by German diktat, you must know anything about inflation accounting. You must not know that when you have inflation, the way to calculate the burden of the debt is to include as an, an income the gain you make because as a debtor, your debt loses value. Okay? That is exactly a, an income that offsets the high price you pay for interest when there is inflation. Interest rates go up because the debtors lose the inflation, therefore they get that much more. Okay? I mean, the, the creditor lose the, to the extent of inflation, therefore interest rates go up to compensate for the fact that they are losing. So if they were gaining 5% and now there is 10% inflation, they get 15%, of which 10% compensates for the inflation loss, and they're left with 5 But then the government that's paying 5 you should agree that of that 15 that it pays, 10 is made up by the fact that it has an income which corresponds to the loss of the holders. The loss of the holders is the gain of the government. Okay? You must take it into account in the government budget, and it is not. Therefore, it appears they have a huge deficit. Now, correcting for inflation means you should subtract from the deficit, the product of the inflation, times the size of the debt. Or if you want to look at the deficit income ratio, then you must take the rate of inflation and multiply it by the ratio of the deficit, the debt uh, to income. The deficit to income, the debt to income, that's right. So at the present time, inflation is approximately, uh, I think the last figure is around four, but it has been around five. The last figure four is four and a half. Four and a half, yeah. Four point five. Four five, yes. It's been around five. Interest rates, therefore, are essentially nine and a half, when in Germany they are below four. The difference is, first of all, the inflation, and then a little more than that because of the exchange risk, okay, which adds some additional points which would disappear if you would enter Maastricht because then there is no more exchange risk because then your exchange is fixed. Okay? And presumably the countries will help each other to maintain the exchange risk. Uh, to, I mean to maintain the exchanges. So if you figure things right, Italy is the one, the only country now that has zero deficit. The only country. Okay? And that this is not a fiction can be seen in another way by looking at the so-called primary surplus, which is the, the difference, okay? It's that uh, part of the, uh, of, of the government uh, um, earnings, of the government uh, receipts, above the payment of interest. In other words, take out of the government budget the payment of interest. And you will find that in Italy, there is a surplus of 30%. That is, current receipts exceed current expenditure without interest of 30%, which no other country in Europe gets even closer. Okay? Even though their real rates may not be very different from Italy. So Italy already has made the gigantic effort by creating this enormous uh, primary surplus, and with that enormous primary surplus, it can very easily pay the interest, the real interest, and still have a balanced budget. In fact, it already has a balanced budget, and it's the only country in Europe that in fact has a balanced budget. Okay? The other countries haven't created the primary surplus that's necessary. Okay? So all of them are behind Italy in this respect, but they don't recognize it because they don't know how to calculate. 
uh, I have been telling Italians, Germans, and all the rest how to compute the deficit when there is inflation. Okay? And I've been citing text and sources. I mean, they're not my invention. Anybody that studies inflation accounting knows that that is the first principle. Okay? There are five or six major biases that inflation produces in the accounts, okay? Like replacement cost instead of uh, original cost, uh, which tends to exaggerate profits, uh, the treatment of inventories, which also tends to exaggerate profit, and so on. And one of the major ones is precisely the fact that the debt, the interest that you should apply to the debt is not the nominal interest rate, but the real interest rate. That is nominal minus inflation. Okay. Now, yes? I'm sorry? It, it seems clear that that's not a correct way of computing the, the ratio, the, the plus minus criteria doesn't seem to be correct according to what you're saying, right? Right. I mean, in other words, they don't understand that you have to adjust right. the deficit it's for the inflation, for what you gain from inflation. Yeah. All right. Okay, but why would, did they do such a mistake? I mean, why do they make such a mistake? Do you, do you think well, they did it for no, no, I mean, all right, now, I think there is a combination of reasons, okay? One reason, let me go back here, one reason is simply ignorance, okay? People do not understand the simple reasoning, okay? And the ignorance is not just limited to the chancellor of Germany, it's widespread even among the Italian public. You are familiar with the fact that People in Italy have complained bitterly when, during the Ciampi government, things were going well. Inflation, and I show you a graph, came down miraculously in a very short time. Interest rates came down, and people were complaining like mad. I used to get 12%, now all I can get is 5 or 7. The fact that there was no inflation didn't matter. Okay? And fundamentally, that is because of a very deep misconception. You see, people don't understand this phenomenon, okay? Now, let me just cite you here one thing that's fascinating. Generally, there is a great contrast between economists and the public, the, the, the common man. Economists always say inflation makes no difference, okay? Because everything moves together. And so it makes no difference. Well, first of all, they exaggerate. In fact, it does make a substantial difference. But it's a secondary order of difference, OK? Is that prices get out of line, that certain things lag behind, that, uh, you know, usual story that uh, everything cannot move together because you cannot change the coin uh, that you put into the parking machine, OK? So the parking machine is now for five cents. And even though the prices have doubled or trebled, you still are not going to change it, okay? So it is not true. Now, this is the trivial example, but there are many more examples, like taxes and so on, that are not adjusted appropriately. Similarly, you are taxed on nominal interest rates. No country yet taxes on real interest rates, which is the only reasonable thing, okay? So that you end up by taxing over 100%. If you do things correctly, you will find that the tax is more than the real interest you earn. Okay. So in real terms, you end up with less money than you started up even though you get some interest. Okay. You can see that if you get 10% interest but inflation is 15, then at the end you've got $95 per $100 that you had. Okay. But you get taxed as though you were earning 15. Now, uh, so in general, people don't understand it. A very great example of not understanding is uh, a recent survey that was made by one of my students, one of my, by now, of course, who are more important than I, a professor at Yale, and <laughs> uh, you know, it belongs, belongs to the large class of students of mine who have done better than I have. However, uh, he conducted a survey in various countries, 
including the United States and including Brazil, asking people uh, whether they thought that wages kept up with inflation. And the remarkable result is that people said, of course not. And they asked them, how long do you think it takes before they catch up? And a very few said, oh, a quarter, mostly said a year or two. Some said never. Even in Brazil, where wages have, you know, the inflation was so high that wages were keeping up instantaneously, practically, okay? They better do that because when inflation is 300% per year or more, if they don't keep up, you're nothing, left nothing, okay? So people don't understand that, in fact, wages, the experience is very clear. Wages follow inflation very closely. Inflation doesn't really affect real wages, except occasionally in some clenched period and so on, but by and large, real wages are not affected by inflation. Okay. And you see, the reason why people think it's so terrible is, is the following. I mean, I think there is evidence of this. They think that when prices go up and they get higher wages, they think they get higher wages because they are worth more. So the increase in salary is a recognition, is a real increase, is a recognition that they're worth more. But then those darn merchants take advantage of the fact that I deserve more, and they raise prices, and they take away what I have earned. Okay. So it's, inflation is all due to these bastards who uh, take advantage to raise prices. Okay. And therefore, it's not true that my wages keep up with prices. My wages keep up with my worth, and prices just take away what I deserve. Now, see, when you start from this mentality, Mr. Cole is probably not very different from these people. I don't really know him personally, so I don't know. But you know, it's very easy not to understand. And on top of that, the Bundesbank, which you think is intelligent enough to understand, has a different reasoning. It says that if inflation makes you a paria because of the deficit, good. Inflation is a bad thing, and anything that makes it bad is a good thing, okay? So if by not understanding how to compute, it makes look like you have a large deficit, the answer is stop inflation. Don't calculate the deficit correctly, stop inflation. Okay. Now that's very important, because the miracle we are proposing is precisely that, since you don't understand how to compute the deficit with inflation, we are going to get zero inflation, and then you will see that the deficit disappears because the interest rates from nine and a half will come down to four or four and a half, and the deficit will disappear. Now, then the next trick is, how do you get zero inflation? Okay? Now that's, of course, the real important trick. And that requires for workers and the unions that represent them to understand inflation is usual, okay? On their part, that is, to understand that what matters is real wages, not nominal wages. If you're given a certain real wage, if we can agree on the real wage part, then you shouldn't care how much you get nominally. And in particular, you can accept zero. As long as the prices were to fall 4% per year, and your real wage would rise. Now, we don't need to do that. We could just say, let's aim at zero price inflation and 4% or 3 or 4% increase in wages due to productivity. Okay. So the trick is to work is to accept the notion that from now on, we will have an increase determined by productivity. Okay. Accept, therefore, a wage increase which is no larger. When wage increases correspond to productivity, unit labor cost doesn't change. When unit labor cost doesn't change, prices do not change. Okay? Provided the change rate is maintained or is declining. And in the case of Italy, in our program, therefore, consists of holding inflation, aiming at zero inflation, okay, through agreement with the unions 
and employers and the government. See, the government must do its part by not raising indirect taxes and so on and so forth. A number of conditions that must be met. Have a compact that aims at zero inflation. Then you get as benefits, first of all, the vanishing of the de deficit and uh, you meet the Maastricht condition by having very low inflation and very low or zero deficit. Okay? Now, you do not meet the deficit, the debt to income ratio, but that it's a stupid condition. And it's been always said that nobody's going to look carefully at that condition, as provided you can show that you are making progress, uh, it's immaterial. And of course, uh, with a balanced budget, uh, you would be making progress uh, toward that aim. Because as the, as the GNP rises, the ratio declines. So you don't even need the surplus. Just the growth, per se, reduces the debt. And, uh, and you can do quite a bit that way. The, uh, let me note that the United States came out of the war, of the Second World War, with a debt that was 1.4 times income. By the time Reagan became president, the ratio was down to 0.38. Okay. Then, of course, Reagan quickly reversed things, and uh, he didn't quite manage to go back to where we were. He w if he had stayed as president long enough, he would have done it. But fortunately, you cannot be president more than twice in this country. So we got rid of him. <laughs> and after that, uh, it's still been very hard to bring down the deficit because the interest got so large that people weren't willing to pay the taxes to pay the interest, the Reagan interest. And that made it very difficult to avoid some deficit. Okay? But, funda yes? Uh, I have a question. Remember, he's the representative of the Italian Libra. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is rather following. You are assuming that you can control Italian inflation by holding unit labor costs. Right. What right. Italians call floor. Right. Cost of labor. Right. 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 But I remember those data that we received from the Congress. Right. 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 Uh, and they show that approximately between uh, uh, July 1992 between July what? 1992, after the... 1932, the yes. Yes, right. Uh, until the middle of 1995, the flux, the unit labor cost, had remained still, still, and inflation had uh, risen at approximately 5%, for, 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 I don't remember the exact figure. So it had uh, fixed unit labor cost, but still it had inflation. Now, what were the determinants of that inflation? Certainly there was there was also a profit effect, probably. Like, um, no, but uh, you cannot separate the two. And there was also, but th there was also another, another dimension, I think, uh, the inefficiency of the Italian distribution. That's right. I think that that adds that, 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 that is true. That is true. I mean, so that, I that mean, is a part you, of the program. If your program say let's control inflation only through trade no, unions, no, I mean, you're going to leave out the two no. percentage I, I think you have to answer separate two different issues. One issue is that, in effect, uh, the price is determined by un un the labor cost, provided the exchange rate is maintained. Okay? If the exchange rate depreciates, then the uh, maintenance of the unit labor cost does not imply that workers maintain their purchasing power or that their purchasing power increases according to productivity. All right? Because if club, club is what the Italian mean by unit labor cost, in Italian is costo del lavoro per unità di prodotto. So C L U B, okay? Club. And that, that terminology was actually invented uh, at the Bank of Italy when I was in charge of a model, modeling Italy, we invented the word club. Uh, club constant means that uh, wages rise as much as productivity, which is the program, okay? Now, that 
ensures that real wages are constant in a closed system. As you can see that in the closed system, club is the reciprocal of the real wage. Okay. Now, <coughs> the, uh, essentially, if you are in an open economy, then the purchasing power of wages has two components. Purchasing power over your own output, the domestic output, and purchasing power over the foreign output. Okay? Now, if the exchange depreciates, then even though the purchasing power over your own output is constant, the purchasing power over foreign output is not constant. Okay. So depreciation per se makes you lose, makes the worker lose purchasing power. But that's not the end. When you have depreciation, the domestic firms find that they can sell abroad at a higher price because their price has fallen when, with the depreciation they are, the price in dollars falls. So to some extent, they try to sell more. And to some extent, they raise the markup. But when they get more abroad, particularly if there is high activity, they also get a higher price at home, in part because they, are, because they have the choice where to sell. Okay? And in part because foreigners right, are unable to compete because they get less dollars per what they export. Okay? So they have to raise their prices, and that makes it easy for the domestic people to raise their prices. In other words, the devaluation makes them, increases the, the uh, ability of the domestic firms to sell abroad or, or at home. Okay? And to some extent, that shows up into higher markup and higher profits. So in that sense, you cannot divide the two. But that is precisely the sense in which it is essential in a program of this kind to look at the effect on the foreign exchange. And one of the things we have in our program is that the foreign exchange, the leader will appreciate. So that the workers will gain, in fact, more than the productivity through the depreciation. And that's only fair, because they lost before through the depreciation, OK? At the advantage of firms, now over the next period, you're going to have a reversal. Firms will be somewhat squeezed, and workers should be earning more. Okay? Now, this is happening at the great, gun, great rate, because fortunately, the victory of the center left has been greeted by the international markets with great warmth, enthusiasm. And the lira has moved uh, since Prodi won the elections down to just over 1,000. It was about 160, it's moved down to 1,015. Remarkable thing. Our plan is being outdated because our program was to bring it to 1,000 in two years. We'll get there before, but that's fine. Now, probably, we don't want to go much beyond that. Why? Because we think that 1,000 is a very nice exchange rate because once this happens, we'll issue a new lira, we'll call the heavy lira, which will be worth 1,000 old liras and one mark. Okay, so the lira will be one mark. Now, no question regarding that before Italy gets into Maastricht, is there a political option for Italy to go to a currency war with the German, with the Deutsche, Deutsche Mark as, as, as the, as the, I mean, try to press the, the Deutsche Yeah, well, this is the, the currency board has been mentioned, and uh, the trouble is that that solution, in my view, is a mechanical, ignorant solution. That is, it is true that if a country doesn't have a reasonable labor union, okay, then maybe what you want to do is to say, look, I put myself in a position where I cannot control the money supply. If you push wages, you get unemployment. Okay? And you do that, you tie your hands. I say, if you have an intelligent labor union, let's agree on how to do it, and let the money supply be adjusted to the needs of the economy. Okay? So if the economy is growing fast, we'll need more money. And we don't, why do we have to wait until we import, we, we get more reserves, and then grow? We don't have to do that. So the currency, I mean, the, the, this so-called uh, currency board, as you know, this has been adopted. This is essentially the Hong Kong system. Okay? 
but essentially Hong Kong creates money only as it gets dollars from the surplus. Okay? So as people deposit dollars, they get Hong Kong dollars one for one. And there's all kinds of problems with it. I mean, in fact, right now Hong Kong has a lot of problems because the inflation, domestic inflation is appreciably higher than the foreign inflation. So you have all kinds of problems, high interest rates and all, all kinds of real problems. And uh, I think counting on intelligent unions, I think we can do it. And by the way, I can say one thing that's very important, that uh, the head of the union which, which, which Luciano works, <coughs> Sergio D'Antoni has already declared twice that he is for the zero inflation program. That they will work for it and that he looks forward. In fact, he's, he asked the new president to call them in for consultation, which he hasn't done yet. He said, what are you waiting for? We are here ready to work together. Which doesn't mean that it would be so easy to reach an agreement because there is a question of the past. Workers have lost some, not as much as they think. First of all, because the comparison has to be made. See, the comparison the workers make when they say we have lost so much is between uh, agreed wages and the cost of living. But actually, there are effective wages are not necessarily as those in the agreement because there are payments above the agreement. Okay. Now, if you look at the actual wages, the differential is not so large, but it is still there. Probably 3% in two years, something like that. But the point is that the argument we are trying to make is don't try to recoup the 3% now, because you won't. If you get a higher 3%, it will show up in higher prices. Okay. Have an agreement that looks forward and says, from now on, I get the cost of living union plus the benefit of the declining exchange rate. Okay. Then everybody will be better off. Okay. Now, one of course of the important consequences of the zero inflation is that interest rates will decline roughly by to the extent of inflation. Now we have four and a half, okay, and interest rates already down to about nine. So when we first wrote this, inflation was five and interest rates were about nine and a half. They can come down another four or five points. Okay. That also means that it encourages investment. Of course, there is inflation illusion that is <laughs> firms should really figure that the, mon the real cost of money is the same if they pay four and no inflation or if they pay nine with inflation. But uh, it actually makes a difference, well, in part because in terms of short-term rates, it makes no difference. But in terms of long-term rates, it does make a difference because if you don't think inflation is going to last, then borrowing at 9% is a bad thing because eventually you, you will have paid nine when interest rate will have come down. Okay? So it does make a difference uh, what the nominal rate is. So you will have that advantage. And of course, uh, that essentially, by controlling cost, you will be able to maintain the advantage in terms of exports. There'll be some loss because as the lead appreciates, that will make it somewhat worse. But then, to some extent, the appreciation will correspond to the fact that Italian inflation is below French or German or Dutch or whatever it is, and that per se justifies appreciation. Okay. So now, so those are the fundamental tricks. What, I, what is being proposed in Italy? See, I didn't quite finish that. There is the 7%. People who speak have refused to understand that that deficit doesn't exist. I had, we had an argument with Italy's most known financial specialist, who is now representing Italy in the uh, <coughs> government of the community, Professor Mario Monti, who uh, claimed that no, he does not want to make the adjustment. Okay, we explained why it has to be made, and he said no. And I think I told you that the reason he said no is because he thought that if you tell the Italians they have no deficit, they will create one immediately. Okay, <laughs> so you must tell them 
you are overburdened with deficit. Therefore, you have to cut down the, the expenditure. Otherwise, it's impossible. So an economist must lie in order to, <laughs> to uh, sort of tell falsehood to people so they behave as he thinks they should behave. I don't believe in that. I believe economists have to say the truth and tell them that because you have no deficit, bless God and don't get into one. Okay? That's the thing to do. You don't have to be persuaded by being squashed by the deficit. So, <clears throat> so what did, just a second, let me just finish this. So what are they saying? Well, I said some say let's not give up Maastricht and some say that next year we have to do a really big financial operation so as to cut down the 7 to 3%. That means a tax levy, tax and expenditure levy of 4% of GNP, which is a gigantic, it's 170 billion. It's a gigantic operation, okay? For what? In order to create a surplus, in order to balance the budget with the fictitious deficit, but really create a huge, a huge surplus. Increase further the primary surplus, create what is really a huge surplus, okay? And as I'll show you in a moment, create a real deflation in the economy and the, in the end a disaster. Okay. Now what we say is forget the big uh, 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 financial levy, forget the, how do they call it, the, I forget the word they use, la, to say, la, I forget the word that's used, uh, sbiosa, come do you call it? Anyway, I mean, for, forget the, the big, the big maneuver, okay? Stangata. Huh? Stangata. Stangata, stangata, which means beaten. Forget the big beating with a, uh, with a rod, okay? Forget it. If you do that, you ruin the economy, and you don't need to, okay? If you can get zero inflation, or just about there, you don't need it. Now, before I go further and show you essentially the implication of the alternatives, I have to make one comment. Why, see we say zero inflation program and we want to program wages as to maintain unit labor cost stable. Why can't you get zero inflation in 97? I mean, uh, yes, why not immediately, why not in 97? The reason unfortunately is that there is lags in retail price formation. All right, that essentially at the retail level, prices depend on what it costs now to buy that good, but to a large extent on what you paid for it last year, okay? Or essentially the inventories are treated at cost rather than at reproduction cost. Okay? So they try to recoup that by Prices not adjusting promptly. And so that means that during, if you try to come down very fast, you end up by creating a larger spread for the intermediaries, for the retailers and so on, which they may not notice because they don't figure things right. Okay? Their profit really are higher, but they may not even notice it. Okay? So you cannot do it too fast because if you do it too fast, you end up by increasing their profits at the expense of the workers. Okay, see the, the manufacturers at the wholesale level will have no advantage because they presumably will pass on the uh, unit labor cost into their prices. But it is at the next stage, uh, at the various stages of uh, uh, services, plus uh, the fact that there is a large volume of services uh, which are not uh, based on goods but you know sort of uh, various kinds of professional service and so on and so forth, where the lags uh, tend to be more substantial. In other words, in the case of labor, you can make an agreement about the wage. You cannot do that as easily with the cleaners, with the lawyers, with the doctors, and so on. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, yeah, well, you can do it to some extent with government employees, although that has some problems of its own. So 
uh, we have to accept a slower pace. And that means that real wages initially cannot rise very much. They can rise some, but there's a limited space until the catch up is finished. That is, until we get to the point where why we're bringing them down, there is some unavoidable loss. Once they are down, the loss will disappear. One way of minimizing that loss would be to get, as he says, a more efficient service industry. Okay? And that's one of the great difficulties, and I think uh, uh, any of you that come from the less advanced countries know the great problem that the, uh, the uh, whole area of retail is exceedingly inefficient. You're still relying on the family store, uh, which has huge uh, uh, markups because they are very inefficient. They, there are deficient stores, namely the supermarkets, the markets and the supermarkets. But, as you can imagine, the merchants hate the supermarkets. Okay? They really are ruining the country right? because they are ruining me and I am the country. Okay? So they fight very hard against giving permits okay? and very hard for all kinds of ridiculous things, which we still have even in this country, namely hours opening and closing hours. Stores only open at 9 o'clock and they must close at 6. Okay. Hell, why? Why don't you let anybody do whatever he wants? Okay. That's because it's not convenient for those people that exist. Okay. So you have this tremendous stronghold of this class, intermediate class, which is large and controls a lot of the local communities in an effort to get a more efficient distribution. But that, I think, is quite right. A lot of the program should be in pushing through a uh, rapid rationalization of the distribution system, creating competition if necessary, even stores, government stores or local entity stores, I mean, not central government, but uh, local stores that compete and so on. Where? In, in Germany. I worked in Germany for yes. a year. Yes. It's a very bad problem there. Your work in yes, Germany. that's right. Do you, think that, uh, do you think that people have any um, you know, power to work that can even change those laws? Or how strong is this you know, real merchant? Well, uh, I think that that is a great problem because uh, the, this class of merchants is very powerful, has, a, this has an enormous influence. In, uh, now, where do you live? In Rome? Yeah. And that's nothing. I mean, if you go to the south, some of the smaller places, they're just very, very hard. Well, it's powerful, but it's very popular. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, it, it's, no, you're going to be careful again. Distinguish between, I mean, more powerful, which simply means it's a combination of will and the organization that it takes to make that will into an action. Okay? There may be a lot of people that are unhappy, but they're organized. Okay? They don't put up candidates and things like that, whereas the merchants do. Okay? And, you know, the, the merchants in Italy are a bad class. There's no question about it. <laughs> we have seen that uh, recently when uh, uh, they gave a, a real example of indecence when uh, they invited to speak at their convention the fascist, the head of the fascist government, and Mr. Prodi, who is now the president, and Mr. Faini was applauded. And when it came to Mr. Prodi, they did not let him speak. They hissed and shouted so that he had to quit without speaking. Well, they, they were the merchants had been invited to shout against Mr. Prodi, essentially because you know, the central left is in favor of laws that will make people pay their taxes. And the merchants do not intend to do that. They want to do whatever is convenient to them. Now, so <clears throat> you have this problem of, uh, for which it is not possible to do things quickly. And there is, you have a trade-off between real wages and quickness. Okay, if you want to do it real quick, then the real wages will not rise. If you take a little more time, then there is a possibility, some margin, for real wages to rise. Now, uh, I want to come back a moment to the following 
think that the uh, uh, so the key propositions really are I think I've told you essentially what is the foundation and uh, what makes you think that all this is visible all right and uh, as you can see, if you follow this program, then in two years, Italy will meet all the requirements for being in Maastricht, at least in three years, because the deficit will come down gradually as interest rates decline. Okay, so it's not instantaneous. Interest rates will move down uh, with inflation, and as inflation comes down, interest comes down, and the deficit comes down. And then, of course, you do have this reinforcing mechanism, which already occurred, unfortunately. I, I should have known that, namely, that as this goes on, the exchange rate appreciates. Of course, I know that there are expectations, and since people expect that this will happen, in fact, it happens quickly. And in fact, to some extent, interest rates will decline on the expectation of future decline, particularly the long rate. And the long rate is still quite high. And you know, anybody can figure out that there are huge capital gains to be made if you buy uh, issues which were still made three, four months ago with a 12% coupon, okay? If the interest rate comes down to, long-term rate comes down to five, uh, these are 10-year issues, the price will appreciate enormously, okay? Now, it may appreciate enormously in the expectation that it will be high later, and therefore some of these things may occur faster than uh, you would think if you didn't allow for people believing that these things will happen. This will all happen to make it, to make it happen, all will help to make it happen. Now, <clears throat> there is, a, I think, important precedence to uh, justify this expectation because one of the key issues here is the, uh, the issue of interest rate behavior and relation between price, between wage and prices, okay? Now, on this connection, uh, we have first done some interesting uh, experiments. Uh, first, let me say this, that during one of the great wonders of the period that follows the devaluation was the behavior of inflation. Now, let me see if I can find this. Yes, you have all seen, let's see, I think that Elizabeth made a slide of the That is the cover sheet of the book. But that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, okay. Now, one of the great wonders of the inflation of the period of in which the lira was depreciated was the following. When the lira went, uh, was pushed out of the EMS, it lost initially about 20%, and then over the rest of the year, as explained under Rudy's, Rudy Dornbusch influence, uh, Rudy Dornbusch, by the way, is a miserable man because he, they had sorrows and they didn't tell me. So he didn't tell me. So he's a miserable man. But <laughs> nonetheless, he's a miserable genius. And as I explained to him, he pushed the Bank of Italy to let the exchange go, not try to get back into the EMS, keep interest rates low, let the exchange depreciate. And it depreciated up to about 30%, reached a peak about 30%, from below 700 to 1,000. Now, of course, at that point, it makes a difference whether you calculate the lira 
Now, when you look at the changes of that magnitude, you get somewhat different answers if you look at the Lira mark or the mark Lira, but anyway, that's roughly 30%. And the great amazing thing is that the behavior of inflation. When that happened, inflation, the graph with inflation is 3.8. Can you see that? 3.8 at the bottom, right? Okay. OK, now you have there one dark, heavy, dark line. OK? That line is what actually happened. And as you can see, inflation up to 94, inflation kept declining in the face of the 30% devaluation. That was an absolutely amazing experience. Okay. It eventually picked up again, but that is because Champi was replaced by Berlusconi. And since he was an incapable man, he quickly <laughs> produced inflation again. Okay? I mean, it, as a head of the government and then as the opposition, okay, who was blackmailing the country, that's how he managed to get that. But you can see that up to as long as Champion was there, the inflation declined. And if we had quarterly data, well, actually, you can see it very clear. Now, one interesting question that we have asked ourselves is why has that happened? How is it possible? How could one achieve this result? Okay. Now, <clears throat> the standard explanations are sort of an important explanation is that to some extent the devaluation of 92 and the 93 was a very weak era in the world markets. Therefore, on the one hand, uh, raw material imports, uh, because raw material prices were falling in the world, they didn't rise too much in liras. Relative to what they were doing abroad, there was more, but not much more. And the, uh, the uh, non-competitive market, at least the uh, industrial production and so on, oligopolistic kind of goods, the foreign firms who were pressed for markets because they were losing markets all over, decided that rather than take advantage, and rather than uh, sort of uh, well, keeping their prices constant, Okay, which would have meant a higher prices in lira, that they would try to compete with the Italian firms by cutting their price. So they essentially cut their export prices in marks, okay, which meant that the Italian prices rose less, and then in turn put pressure on the Italian firms not to raise prices too much. So this combination of things was certainly one important element. Now. In addition to that, uh, there was domestic contraction, 92 and 93. Okay? I explained that essentially that domestic contraction was the combination in 93 was the combination of the shock of devaluation. The Italians are pride, I would say, pretty proud people, sometimes not reasonably so, but uh, just like the Spaniards or whatever it is. <laughs> and or the Greek, and they took very badly the devaluation of cotton as something demeaning that they had to devalue 30 percent. Okay, and it took time to understand that that's what made their fortune, but it was demeaning. That was a source of depression, and on top of that, the Amato and Champi government, the good governments, beat them in terms of taxes really hard. Okay. They raised taxes and they made a big step which moved essentially the real deficit to zero. The corrected deficit came close to zero already then. Later on it got even more so, but already very close to zero through this very sharp rises in taxes. That reduced consumption and uh, discouraged people and put them in a very de depressed mood. And so 
you had then lower consumption, okay, and lower investment because the, the activity was low. So there was a, the only thing that was pushing was exports because the devaluation put them in a position to increase exports and they rose quite fast. But on the whole, there was a contraction and that presumably may have helped in holding prices down. But of course, there was another element, and that was that in 1932, for the first time, labor agreed to a nominal wage contract that in 1993 was uh, confirmed by Mr. Champi, and there was a specific arrangement about a plan for prices and wage inflation, okay? both of which were supposed to decline over the next three years. Okay? Four and a half, in the 96, I'm sorry, 95, three and a half in 96, and two and a half in 97 was the program. I personally told Mr. Champi that that program was inadequate. It should have been two, one, zero, okay? Well, before I got there, it was even higher, and he did cut it down uh, with some effort. He was able to persuade him to cut some, but still, it was better than nothing. Okay. And the wages were supposed to behave accordingly, allowing productivity to some extent. Now, now the interesting question is which of these, oh, and then on top of that, there was the AMATO, I mean, there were these fiscal laws, okay, which by reducing income contributed to a depressed economy and therefore contributed to lower prices. So the question is, what did what? So to try to answer this question, we have made three simulations, the results of which are shown here. In the first is the following. A group of people, and particularly, I think, at the Bank of Italy, said that the reason why inflation was still four and a half or three and a half is because we had devalued. In other words, with the devaluation, we had low inflation. Without devaluation, would have been even lower. Okay. Why? Because without, I mean, without that, there would not have been higher import prices. Right? The devaluation increased import prices and domestic prices too, to some extent. So they said, if you just had forgotten, if you just had, and they don't say how, if you just had somehow managed to weather the storm and not the value, okay, or maybe 15% as they first thought, but no more, you would have saved yourself all the trouble. Now, it turns out that, uh, so one of these simulations, see the first one, the heavy line says storia, that means history, that's the actual history. So underneath that, here, uh, lira nello sme, that is, keeping the lira in this May, possibly 15% lower, but fixed exchange. Okay. So you got in the new law thing. Of course, they don't tell us how you do it, because the Italian Bank of Italy tried that and was unsuccessful. That is, the uh, investors didn't believe it, therefore they kept pulling out money, and the, the uh, Bank of Italy threw in a lot of reserves, and then at the end gave up. And in fact, so the one crime that has been claimed by Mr. Perlusconi when he attacked Mr. Ciampi, who had been prime minister before him, is that he wasted billions in trying to defend the lira when he shouldn't. And maybe he's right to some extent. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Ciampi was perhaps conventional. Central bankers e hate to yield to speculation. Okay. They always hope to uh, beat the speculators and give them big losses. And uh, so he tried hard. Anyway, he didn't succeed. So to, uh, this simulation tells you what would have happened if you somehow had managed to put together enough reserves to throw into the breach so as to maintain the 15%. And then after that, you had to keep very high interest rates to attract capital. Okay. So you really would have had to continue with the 15% or so interest rates that prevailed 
as the Bank of Italy tried to bring back the capital, 15-20%, they reached 20%. Okay. Now, in that situation, of course, it is true that the, uh, you get the result which is shown by the broken line. Okay. It is true that inflation would have been lower. Okay. If you somehow could have maintained the exchange rate, you would have avoided the devaluation, inflation would have been lower. However, at what cost? Well, the cost you can see in the remaining graphs. First, the, in terms of the, the GNP, uh, you do get a depressed level of the GNP, even though in 94, for a complicated reason, it's a little higher, but uh, the rest is lower. Okay, except in 94, it is always appreciably lower and it accumulates to something like 4% lower. So you would have to sacrifice output and employment. Okay, either you had plenty of unemployment, that policy would have led to more unemployment. Okay. This shows what it does to investment. You have high interest rates, therefore lower investment. Okay, and so on. And of course, the worst part is in terms of the balance of payments. The balance, I mean, you would not have had the huge increase in exports. Therefore, the uh, balance would have remained uh, negative and you've been accumulating more debt, okay? Which presumably at some point would have forced you to the value anyway. Okay? So at best, it would have been a transitory policy and would have been pretty bad for the country. Then the next thing we tried was to see Suppose you had everything else equal, you are, you are out of this million and so on, but let's take out the Amato tax measure. Okay. Now, essentially, without going into details, what that does is actually to uh, somewhat reduce employment because the drain from the economy would have reduced the demand. So in terms of output, you find that uh, the Amato maneuver uh, would have in other words, that without the amount of maneuver, the output is higher. Uh, and the, um, right, the, uh, yes, the, the amount of maneuver is, uh, is the thin line. And uh, a little careful here. No, 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 I guess that, uh, uh, the reason is, I think, essentially that <coughs> you might have saved, spared yourself the great deflation of 93. I remember, I don't remember exactly how that works. But in, in, in terms of uh, inflation, the uh, Amato maneuver doesn't really make too much difference. Now, the last, uh, that is the broken line, okay? No, in terms of inflation, uh, you get a lower rate of inflation because the, the amount of maneuver is a deflationary maneuver. So you get less inflation. But you get bad consequences in terms of output. And then the last one is essentially the effect of the labor. And it shows what would have happened without the labor agreement. And the results are dramatic. The top line is the rate of inflation that would have existed without the accord. And you can see that while inflation declined, it would have increased substantially, gotten to a high level, a lot of harm to the government deficit, and so on and so forth. And we conclude essentially that the fundamental thing that worked is the agreement, the labor agreement. That was the fundamental anchor that permitted the low rate of inflation. So that means that we know that if we can get labor and the rest to work together, and we can maintain the exchange rate stable, then we really have a good handle on inflation. So that's important to understand what works and what doesn't. Now, <clears throat> when you look at, of course, the whole history, you've got to remember this particular episode that 
in the spring of 93, I mean, Champy came in the spring of 93, and he contributed to the lowering of inflation, okay, as long as he was there. Uh, he then left, and the dramatic effect of Mr. Uh, well, the contrast between Champy and the next government is in a graph, which I hope I can find here, which shows two things. The behavior of inflation, the behavior of exchange rates, and the behavior of interest rates. Okay. The dramatic thing is that under Champy, the differential between the Italian lira and the German mark which measures the trust of investors in uh, lira-denominated instruments, okay? How much they believe the government will pay and to what extent they believe the exchange rate will not deteriorate. It's a major measure of that. Under Champia, I don't, cannot find it immediately, went, the premium went from about five and a half to two and a half in a little over a year. Now, Italian interest rates okay, are determined by what? Well, fundamentally, you live in a country now which has totally open capital movements. Okay. So when I speak of investors trusting the government or not, I speak primarily of Italian investors. It's not Mr. Soros. It's the Italians that either trust the government and keep the money there or don't and just pull out their money. Okay? And when, of course, people want to move the capital out, what happens? Well, as you understand, if you don't have fixed exchanges, if you have fixed exchange rates and the capital moves out, then the central bank pays out reserves and the dollars, you know, you want dollars, here is the dollars, take them out, as long as I have reserves. At some point, I have no more, and then I have to devalue, which happened in 1952. But when you don't have that, when capital wants to move, there is only one way capital as against reserves really moves, and that is by moving goods. So in the long run, the only way you can move capital is by increasing the net exports. What happens in the short run? Well, I want to sell liras, and nobody wants to buy them. Hmm? I want to buy marks, and nobody wants to sell them. Well, the lira goes down. Okay. You get sharp depreciation effects. Now, under Mr. Champy, the exchange rate improved somewhat, not dramatically, but improved somewhat, nor was it desirable for it to move too much because the export surplus was essential to the maintenance of the Italian uh, development. But the decline in the risk premium showed up in a decline in interest rates because Italian interest rates in an open market are German interest rates, okay, now let me step one back. You remember the fundamental principle of uh, interest rate parity, right? That interest rate differentials is essentially compensated by depreciation. That is, if a country has a higher interest than another, it is because its country is going to depreciate. Because the real return to a German investing in lira is the lira return minus the rate of depreciation of the lira, okay? So fundamentally, you have dif interest differentials equal exchange rate differential. But what about the exchange rate differential? You know about purchasing power parity. Under purchasing power parity, exchange rate differential is the differential in the rate of inflation. So fundamentally, Italian interest rates, the real Italian rates are equal to real German rates plus risk premium, or nominal rates are equal to German nominal rates minus German inflation plus Italian inflation. Now, as the inflation was coming down, but mostly as the risk premium came down enormously, interest rates went, came down about five percentage points in a little over a year, okay? The <coughs> government deficit improved and the uh, investment were helped, and so on and so forth. Well, there was a dramatic effect of Mr. Champion.
the moment he left, everything began moving in reverse. Exchange rate <coughs> began to depreciate again, modestly. Interest rates went up rather quickly back. And by the end of the Berlusconi government, they were close to where Mr. Champion had left. And whatever he didn't do, and why did that happen? Well, because the rest of the world had no confidence. See, Champion was an exceptional man. He was the former uh, governor of the Bank of Italy with an international fame. He was very well known. He worked in many international organizations. He was trusted, Mr. Berlusconi. You know, there was no reason to trust him. He had to show. Well, he began by not paying any attention to the finances. He did not prepare the first financial plan in time. He let two months go by because he was busy with capturing the, te the televisions. He, he owned, he had a monopoly on the private sector, and now he had the government televisions under his wing. So he took care of changing all the people so they'd be his people and so on. He was so busy doing that, paid no attention to what was important. So even though, as he came to power, I wrote an article <laughs> in the Corriere della Sera, Mr. Berlusconi, the main thing you need to worry about is give confidence to foreign investors. Continue the tight fiscal policy. He came in promising tax cuts and the like, and he proceeded to do it. Much of that was wrong, because even though in some cases it was justified as incentives, they were stupid incentives for Italy. You know? Essentially, you got an incentive if you hired more people. But you know how Italians are. They took the firm, divided in half, okay? And from the old firm, they, they sent out a certain number, and then they were taken by the new firm. And the new firms, of course, was creating employment. Therefore, they got the benefits, okay? And the same thing happened with incentive to invest where all kinds of dirty tricks occurred, so there was a lot of money wasted in these programs. Anyway, <coughs> the limit was reached, of course, as I told you, when Berlusconi was pushed out of the government. He wanted immediate elections. He said, I want elections in spring. And the president of the republic told him, go to parliament, because I don't control elections, parliament does. Tell them to dissolve themselves then we'll have elections, and he could not persuade parliament. He decided to boycott the country, to put pressure on parliament by ruining the country. So he decided to vote against the financial law that was proposed by the, the government that succeeded him, a law which was absolutely essential because his own financial law had been inadequate. Okay? When the world saw that half the country was willing to ruin the country to have its way, well, everybody took the money out, including I. I had very little. <coughs> but whatever I had, <laughs> I took out. <laughs> OK, I had just a, a deposit with a bank. Uh, anyway, the lira jumped from about 1,000 when Berlusconi came in to 1280. Okay. Now, at that point, because the tragedy was that the inflation, the, the devaluation of the lira, created inflation through the two routes I mentioned. In the foreign goods were more expensive, and Italian firms were able to charge higher prices. The markup rose. The wages kept on their path, as agreed, remarkably so. But prices did not. The, by the way, the plant was four and a half, three and a half, two and a half. As long as Champy was there, it was four and a half, and it was three and a half to the middle, to the time he left, inflation was down to three and a half. I think you might be able to see it from the graph. But anyway, it was down to exactly three and a half. As soon as Berlusconi took over, with the devaluation, the inflation went up again. So the reason the whole thing failed is not that the idea of a pact was wrong. It's not that you cannot have a pact. It's only that if for the pact to work and to be fair, you must avoid devaluations. Okay? You must avoid devaluations, which are, see, the special feature is Italy had had many devaluations, but in the past, they were essentially due to labor 
pushing for higher nominal wages, which eventually made the Italian product non-competitive, led to financial crisis and to devaluation. But this time, the devaluation had nothing to do with wages. Wages were perfectly well behaved. Unit labor cost was well behaved, and the devaluation only had with capital invested in Italy by Italians and foreigners losing confidence in the country and trying to get the money out. So <clears throat> that cost created a period of great uneasiness because the uh, workers were losing and getting more and more questionable as to whether you ever wanted to enter in another agreement like that. Okay? And of course, stupid people like the one I debated on TV uh, claimed that if we had had escalator clauses, that wouldn't happen. Well, that's because he's an idiot. He doesn't understand that, and I tried to explain it to him, and you know what he did? He laughed when I was explaining. I was trying to explain to him. I didn't see him, but I'm told that's what he did. I tried to explain to him that if we had had escalator clauses, we have had inflation and the same loss of purchasing power, only on an inflation path. Because the inflation is unavoidable when you devalue, right? When you devalue, foreign goods cost more, okay? And if you try to index your productivity having ch not changed, you try to keep up with foreign prices, costs go up, prices go up, and so you get inflation, and then wages have to go up to catch up. So there's nothing you can do. The workers do lose whenever there is a devaluation of that magnitude. So since then, the exchange rate has moved back. And thanks God, there's been a tremendous last step when Mr. Prodi was uh, uh, won the elections. Now, we are essentially working on that principle of getting down back the road to get the workers to believe that we will not have any more devaluations. Okay? Now, it's not, unfortunately, entirely simple because you have people like this Mr. Uh, Bertinotti, who is the head of a 9% group that commands 9% of the votes, which is extreme left. He really is a communist and is as stupid and ignorant as the communists are in economics affairs. You know, communists may have certain virtues in some area, but they never understood economics very much, and as you can see from Russia. And uh, he keeps insisting that we should have escalator clauses. I and the head of the union say we do not want escalator clauses. We want to negotiate wages. We don't want to have any mechanical device. Okay? Unfortunately, the government does not have a majority without this splinter group. So there is some question as to whether they are going to be able to prevent another scare. Okay? It's, not, it's not entirely guaranteed. You know, to some extent, it will depend on whether Mr. Bertinotti can be persuaded. Uh, you know, I kept telling him that the reason workers lost is not because of the lack of escalator clauses, it's because he voted with the extreme right against the financial law. So it's his fault if the workers are worse off. But, and I said from now on, when you vote, remember what effect this will have on the change rate. If you love workers, don't vote in a way that will produce devaluation. Will you understand? No, he's too stupid, I'm afraid. I don't know. I don't really know whether he's stupid or not, or just plain stupid. And uh, maybe he can be persuaded. In any event, you have a general idea of how this thing can work. Uh, it does rely, by the way, the, the, uh, the association of manufacturers, and in general, entrepreneurial groups, large and small. Here my, I have present here my nephew, Enrico Modigliani, who was the president of one of the local uh, units of the young manufacturers, right? Yes, that's right. Of the small enterprise, I'm sorry, yes. Yes, the association of manufacturers of small enterprises. Uh, anyway, in general, these groups are in favor of the program. Okay? They want to see it work. Because for them, it means on the one hand, lower interest rates, opportunities to expand, maintaining their markets to some extent, some squeeze on profits, but not too serious. Okay? And the <clears throat> so there is a will of, I think, a substantial 
group of those that matter. And if they stick to something like this, I think Italy can come out so that in two to three years, it will meet all the requirements of Maastricht that matter and be probably the first country to meet those requirements. Because it will have lower inflation and lower deficits than any other country. And with the entry, the lower interest rates can be assured. Because by the time Italy is a member of the PAC, all right, Italian interest rates cannot be higher than German interest rates. You see, you have this great paradox. And when Italy was pushed out of the uh, common market, the idea was that they might now be free to have lower interest rates because the exchange rate no longer being pegged. Uh, you could have heard lower interest rates at the cost of devaluation. And what happened, in fact, is that interest rates stayed systematically higher. Why? Because of this terrible risk premium, the exchange risk. Okay? Uh, and so that uh, some of it was, in, was inflation differential. Italy kept a somewhat higher inflation rate. But by the middle of this period, actually, the Germans were even higher inflation. So there wasn't always one direction. But some, some of it was, inter, was inflation differential. But uh, much of it was the risk premium due to the exchange rate. And as I said, we know that it is due to the exchange rates because when the government of Italy issues bonds denominated in dollars or marks, okay, the differential, instead of being 500 percentage points, is between 0.3 and 0.4, between 30 and 40. Okay. So the risk of the country as such, or the risk of the government solvency, is not regarded as large. It is simply that if you invest in Italy, you're subject to the great risk that Berlusconi will create another jump in interest rate, in the exchange rate, and then you lose your shirt. Okay? Because you, you gain 2% on the interest rate, but you lose in one month at the rate of 20% per year or 30% per year. Okay? So it is that exchange risk that says, I'm not going to buy Italian denominated instruments. Whether I am Italian or French makes no difference. I, as an Italian, I'm not going to invest in, the, in Italian uh, instruments because when I think of what I could have in dollars, okay, if there is a depreciation, I would rather be in dollars. Okay. So essentially, that differential comes from the fear of depreciation of the exchange rate. Once you are in and you've got fixed exchanges, your rate should be within 30 or 40 basis points of the rest. And you know, by that time, with the Italian miracle having been completed, maybe even the 30 points would disappear. Okay, you've shown what you've been able to do. I think you deserve some credit for that. So I would think that uh, the problem of the deficit is cured. And in fact, in a year or two, there'll be a surplus, because this huge primary surplus is not needed. Okay? Once interest rates are down to 4%, it's not needed. And so there will be finally a time where they will be able to cut taxes okay, and spend more on important programs, including training programs and the like, which are very much lacking in Italy. And of course, Italy still has a huge problem, which is the South. Okay? Unemployment in the South is gigantic. There is, I think, what I call the, I forget whose law, I think Baldassare's law, that says that in Italy, in every region, women's employment, unemployment is twice that of men. Okay? So you start from the north, unemployment of men, 4%, women, 8%. Then you take that and multiply it by one and a half, and you get unemployment in the, in the center. So <clears throat> in the center, four becomes, I think, six. That's right. I think more than that, about 10. Yes. The women, the double. Then you get to the south, and you get 30% or 25% among men and among women, twice as much. 
Okay, now that problem is still there. And that problem is going to be a hard one to solve. Okay? Because it really made complex by many, many problems. And uh, uh, the unfortunate thing is that in the South, people wait without working until they can get a post office job. Because the post office job is bliss, right? If you get a post office job, you don't work too much, you get a nice pension when you retire, and you can start your pension at 55. Uh, it's a little changed, but uh, it has been. You see, you have this part of the Italian scandal, this is the pension system, which, by the way, has been also almost fixed. Not quite, but huge uh, step forward has been made by Mr. Dini and the unions that have worked together. So, you know, in many ways, there is a sign of maturity that is very, very encouraging. And I think that uh, maybe before my time is gone, Italy may be the first of the class. <laughs>